Hey, Mike here. Uh, so we got another little uh, experiment going on here. I uh, built this over the weekend, got the idea last week. Uh, we got the R290 uh, refrigerator here, little uh, mini fridge, not great lighting here. Um, but what we're running is uh, on the condenser side, we have a uh, heat exchanger here made out of these sheet metal cones and then a thermosiphon utilizing the static condenser that I built a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why I'm doing this. I'm not going to go into it too much, but uh, essentially what I wanted to be able to do eventually was to be able to build a, uh, a small vapor compression refrigerator that uh, has a removable condenser. Um, it sounds like an odd thing, but uh, I thought it would be a pretty nifty idea if I could make this thing uh, not only modular in the sense that the cooling unit can be removed from the top of the refrigerator, but in addition, in order to access the guts of the fridge, once this thing's redesigned and a little more compact, um, that you would have a large heat exchange surface, um, you know, that's kind of aesthetically pleasing, which is what I was going for there with that, uh, that condenser, um, and that condenser could be removed and actually just popped off without affecting and uh, uh, you know cutting into or unhooking the any any of the sealed lines to the vapor compression system um, and I would do that by uh, having a uh, closed loop thermosiphon which is what I have going on here um, and uh, this this condenser here is hooked up to a coil um, that sandwiched to the condenser coil and uh, the loop that comprises the thermosiphon contains uh, liquid and liquid propane at saturation. Um, so there's a lot of liquid in there. Um, exactly how much I don't know, but probably somewhere between like 60 and 80 percent of the capacity of the volume of the loop is full of liquid. And uh, and the job of that uh, that liquid in there is to is to uh, transfer the heat from the condenser of the vapor compression system, and then. Uh, cool that that uh, that liquid or that vapor and liquid combination up here so um, so to explain a little more detail of what this thing is um, there's three sheet metal cones here that are about nine inches in diameter at the top and about two inches in diameter at the bottom they're essentially identical they're based on that funnel right there um, the shape of that funnel uh, I measured that funnel and uh, came up with uh, an arc to draw on the sheet metal and then to cut it out with snips and then uh, I made two of them for each cone and then wrapped them around the, uh, the uh, funnel and then taped it with foil tape. Um, so they slide together really nicely. And then I used that cone over there to wrap three coils around that, uh, starting at the base and working my way up, such that if it has the same taper as the cones, the, uh, the coil slides down inside the cone pretty well, and then another cone slides into that, a coil on top of that, and another cone in, into that. And then the whole thing is, is clamped together right now with uh, two wooden plugs. That one's tapered slightly <clears throat> with the all thread going through it to tighten it, tighten it up. <clears throat> um, hopefully, eventually, I was, I was intending, if this were to work out rather well, um, that just the weight um, of the, the condenser, or the whole thermosiphon assembly would uh, hold it all together. And uh, the coils would actually be metallurgically bonded in some way to, uh, to a cone, probably made of stainless steel or copper or some similar material. Um, and in that case, they would actually just be two cones and two coils. Uh, the condenser coil would be wrapped around the lower cone and the thermosiphon cone would be on the inside of the upper cone. Then you have two metal cones that would come in direct contact with each other to transfer the heat from the condenser of the vapor compression cycle to the thermosiphon. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of really high hopes for this. Essentially what I'm trying to do here is to prove to myself that the idea is flawed and that it's impractical so that I can move on to other things. Um, I think it would be really nifty to make something like this work. I think it would be kind of neat. Um, but um, there, there's a lot of design challenges and uh, I just think it's, it's adding a lot of unnecessary complication to something that should be a, a bit relatively simple. Um, so what we have is uh, the discharge from the compressor comes up into the top of the condenser coil and then exits out the bottom and moves on to the filter dryer and the capillary tube and into the evaporator. Um, the top of the thermosiphon coil, which is the, the top coil, uh, goes up into the, uh, the condenser of the thermosiphon 
and then drains back down into the bottom of that coil and then is reboiled away and vaporizes and creates a bit of a bubble, bubble pump. Uh, the beer this evening is uh, Widmer Hef. Uh, it was cheap, so. <laughs> ah, so. Um, so far, the performance of it is not great. Um, we're running at pretty high, uh, uh, well, well, high discharge temperatures, but uh, high head pressures in general. So very high condensing temperatures. Um, very piss poor subcooling coming off of this. Um, it's pretty hot on the outside of that uh, that condenser coil. Didn't expect a lot of subcooling. Um, didn't get a lot with the uh, paraffin tank either. A um, few degrees. Anywhere from about you know seven to fifteen degrees of subcooling, which is pretty poor. So, before I even built this thing, I expected that I would need a subcooling loop after this heat exchanger. And uh, if I were ever to try to make this work, that's exactly uh, the case. Um, in order to get this uh, thermosiphon to work well, um, you have to get a good bit of liquid in there in order to get the bubble pump action to, uh, to occur. I don't have a sight glass in it now, although when I first assembled it, I did put a small quarter inch sight glass, quarter inch flare sight glass. Now I had some doubts about whether or not this was going to work, um, although I did get to see some liquid in there um, and even some bubbling if I were to apply some heat to the line. Uh, this was on the return here. So the liquid coming, falling from the condenser back into the uh, thermosiphon evaporator. Um, I could get some bubbling going up through there if I were to, like, say, heat this line just a little bit with the, uh, um, the heat gun. Actually, even just putting my hand to it um, would apply enough heat to get some bubbling in there. Um, my concerns with this, and I, and I think I was, uh, I was correct in my, um, my predictions, um, <clears throat> this kind of destroyed the vacuum a very, very slight vacuum that occurs in the uh, the liquid fall line, the return from the condenser. Uh, because there's a larger cross-sectional diameter to that, uh, um, to that sight glass, um, the liquid falling from the condenser back into the thermosiphon evaporator, um, it kind of lost its um, liquid plug um, as it fell. So that slight amount of, of um, vacuum head or just vacuum in general um, kind of uh, destroyed some of the flow that could occur in this. So once I removed this and just put uh, a simple quarter inch union in there, um, it improved matters um, somewhat. Um, getting, uh, getting a little more refrigerant in there definitely helps as well. Um, you know, maybe this uh, sight glass issue is, was what I think it is, but uh, um, that's my interpretation right now. So as the thing's running right now, um, it was really hot in here today. It was it was well over 100 degrees when I opened the shop up. It, the thing wasn't keeping up. Uh, this condenser for the, the the DC cycle was tremendously hot. Um, I also had a lot of heat coming out of my uh, thermosiphon condenser, which I was pleased with. But if I'm going to have to run at super super high head pressures, like up over 350 pounds, which corresponds to what do we got here? 155 degrees. Um, that's that's certainly unreasonable. Um, and uh, but for the most part, right now, the way the thermosiphon is running, that seems to be the case. You have to run at pretty pretty high temperatures on the condenser in order to get enough temperature difference between that and the uh, the kind of ambient environment that the static condenser seems to be existing in to get much heat up there. Now, right now, the supply coming from the evaporator is quite warm, quite warm. So that's just the passive. Uh, you know, pumping of, of, of uh, liquid and vapor that's traveling up to the top and uh, there's some heat coming off the top of the condenser but it very quickly disappears and cools and so the return line is rather cold um, and I want to see a, a temperature difference between those things I mean I want to have that cold return but the amount of heat that that thing's actually um, dissipating compared to what's being produced by the by the VC system is uh, it's it's pretty marginal. It's pretty small. So I mean, for instance, let's say that thing's discharging about you know 200 250 watts of heat. Um, that thing up there is probably discharging you know 40 watts maybe. You know it's it's pretty small in the grand scheme of things. So uh, what we what essentially we have here is a really piss poor refrigerator. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to end up having to do is. Uh, 
is just return to a static condenser. And I'm comfortable with that. I absolutely am comfortable with that. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention that there's also a pressure gauge on the thermocycle, so I can read what the saturation uh, pressure and temperature are uh, in that cycle, um, which I presume is essentially the average temperature between those two. Um, the more liquid I put in there, generally the higher pressure that that, that seems to exist at. Um, and also the, the more heat transfer that I get through there. Um, but, uh, but it's just, you know, one more, uh, one more metric to try to understand the system. Um, you know, ultimately I was trying to make this thing modular, but there was another reason for that. Um, I also wanted to be able to include some paraffin into that system and the, the heat, uh, uh, you know, dissipation cycle of the, of the condenser. Um, and then utilize the thermosiphon to dissipate that heat over a longer period of time after the condenser of the VC cycle, you know, melted the wax, uh, you know, some, some type of paraffin material. Uh, I'm not abandoning paraffin. Um, I did some tests with that here last week, um, and uh, it was, you know, it was marginally successful. Um, here you can see this larger coil on the middle, that was the thermosiphon, and then this smaller line on the outside, that was the condenser. It's 50 feet of 3 16 in there and maybe about 25 or 30 feet of quarter inch representing the thermosiphon. Um, that seemed to work rather well, um, the thermosiphon at, at least. It seemed to, uh, to keep up and, and uh, uh, keep the wax somewhat solidified, but the, um, the distance between those two coils and the piss pour uh, heat transfer, um, you know, uh, heat conducting capacity of the wax um, I think really limited things quite quite a, quite a bit. Um, you know, once that wax would really liquefy, um, the head pressures would continue to rise, and you know, discharge temperature would rise, and piss poor subcooling again. Um, and uh, there was quite a delay before the uh, the thermosiphon would be discharging that heat and really be cycling. Uh, so you know, one way to go about you know addressing that issue is to you know essentially bond. The, uh, the thermosiphon coil to the condenser coil, or, or really get them really quite close to one another. So, uh, so there's good heat transfer, so that, that thermosiphon starts to dissipate that heat rapidly. Um, I didn't do that here. Um, I think the reason was uh, I was a little hurried. Um, the diameter of the inner thermosiphon coil was already set from a previous experiment, um, and kind of a lack of forms you know, to, to wrap the two of them with. Um, but uh, you know, I learned a lot from it, and hey, now I got six pounds of Vaseline sitting around if you need it. So, <laughs> can care for a lot of uh, a lot of cold sores with that, um, or have a big party. I don't know. Uh, so, um, I'm not abandoning the paraffin entirely. Um, probably what I'm going to end up experimenting with is designing a static condenser that utilizes some paraffin in it, um, such that. Uh, uh, I don't really limit the heat exchange capacity of the condenser, um, but uh, at the same time, I try to include some paraffin um, for it to, uh, you know, that, that the condenser somewhat bonded to, you know, a metallic container. Um, I haven't exactly figured out how I'm going to do that, especially with this design here. Um, but I am going to get into some metal spinning here in the next few weeks. I'm going to purchase a lathe, get a few parts, a few tools, and uh, get into some metal spinning. I was hoping to, uh, if this was going to work out, that eventually I would design better cones um, through a metal spinning process. Um, but um, another interest of mine is just making the condenser coils themselves, uh, making a nice hyperboloid um, form to you know both wrap them on and to to uh, you know, maybe even uh, you know, bond the uh, the the condenser too. So uh, <clears throat> you know, such a hyperboloid shaped tank uh, might contain a paraffin of some sort uh, that the condenser is uh, um, discharging heat into, um, and then melting, and then. Uh, uh, once the compressor and everything shuts off, um, that would continue to cool and to re-solidify. Um, so it's something I'm going to have to work with here in the next couple of weeks. But 
Um, a little busy here this week. I'm trying to buy a pickup truck and got a few other things going on. So I've I've been rushing around trying to get a few things done out here in the shop. Um, I've been doing more thinking than actually building. Um, here we have some pressure transducers. There's two of them. Um, they are zero to 300 PSI, um, uh, five volt pressure transducers. I think they read about 0.5 volt at zero PSI and about 4.5 volts at 300. So I can wire those into the zoom box. Got a few parts to do that. Um, just got to kind of wire everything up to even uh, get them set up. Um, I did actually buy uh, eighth inch NPT uh, natural pipe thread T's uh, to put them right here on the bottom of the uh, um, these uh, pressure gauges and uh, it actually didn't work out. Um, his pipe thread is notoriously uh, leaky and uh, maybe I just needed a better thread sealant of some sort but I just kind of gave up and uh, I had some adapters um, and just put them right there for now to, for some initial testing so you know it the sucker is pretty ugly right now but um, you know I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with it <laughs> um, you know there's there's certain things like this project I don't want to invest too much time into it um, and that's why it's kind of ugly um, but uh, you know I just that, that rapid prototyping is a lot of fun being able to just kind of slap stuff together and uh, and, and get some kind of performance out of it get a little bit better understanding so I can move forward um, there's certain projects like that static condenser which was the first static condenser I ever built and uh, you know it took me all day it was a lot of work invested in that a lot of thinking a lot of time and uh, I'm glad I did it I'm, I'm really glad I did it um, but there's other things that I don't want to invest as much time in for instance I would want to get a lathe learn how to metal spin and then you know, trying to make all these cones and do this really elaborate work to try to just find out that uh, this isn't the direction that I want to go. Um, but, um, you know, for now, I don't really have a lot of time to uh, rebuild this thing. Um, I'm going to let it run for a couple of days, get the pressure transducers set up, learn a, bit, a little bit about them, and uh, get a little better understanding of what's going on in this cycle. Um, and then eventually I'm probably just going to eliminate this heat exchanger and go back to just the static condenser. Um, even leaving it up high like this and adding some kind of subcooling loop um, if I need to add some more surface area uh, to that. And um, along with the pressure transducers, you know, just go kind of back to the basics and uh, learn a little bit there and then move back into the evaporator and do some more work down there because there's a lot to be done there. Um, I'm thinking about going with a slightly stronger solution of, of uh, glycol and water, slightly lower freezing point, um, and also messing around with the baffle and uh, changing the evaporator coil and things like that. So I just kind of move back and forth to whatever interests me at the time, and just kind of tweak things over time, and uh, you know, just just it's fun. It's a really it's a lot of fun. I really would encourage anyone to uh, to pursue this as a hobby. Um, definitely requires a little bit of research before you just jump jump into it but um, honestly with some basic understanding and a couple of simple tools anybody can slap this stuff together um, you kind of need to do a little bit of brazing sometimes but uh, you can get a lot done with flare fittings um, it's not good for a permanent installation but um, somebody might argue that that you could use it permanently but I don't personally like them for something permanent because I think they're a little leaky but anyway so that's enough ramble for this evening I'll talk to you later thanks for watching